Chapter 15 of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Duvall. Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton. Horace Greeley. Among the hills of New Hampshire, in a lonely, unpainted house, Horace Greeley was born February 3, 1811, the third of seven children. His father was a plain farmer, hardworking yet not very successful, but aided by a wife of uncommon energy and good spirits, notwithstanding her many cares. Besides her housework and spinning and making the children's clothes, she hoed in the garden, raked and loaded hay to help her husband, laughing and singing all day long, and telling her feeble little son Horace stories and legends all the evening. Her first two children having died, this boy was especially dear. Mrs. Greeley was a great reader of such books as she could obtain, and remembered all she read. It requires no great discernment to see from whence Horace Greeley derived his intense love for reading and his boundless energy. He learned to read, one can scarcely tell how. When two years old, he would pore over the Bible as he lay on the floor and ask questions about the letters. At three, he went to the district school, often carried through the deep snow on the shoulders of one of his aunts or on the back of an older boy. He soon stood at the head of his little class in spelling and reading and took it so much to heart when he did happen to lose his place that he would cry bitterly so that some boys, when they had gained the right to get above him, declined the honor because it hurt Horace's feelings so. Before he was six years old, he had read the Bible through and Pilgrim's Progress. Their home contained only about 20 books, and these he read and reread. As he grew older, every book within seven miles was borrowed and perused after the hard day's work of farming was over. He gathered a stock of pine knots and, lighting one each night, lay down by the hearth and read, oblivious to all around him. The neighbors came and made their friendly visits and ate apples and drank cider, as was the fashion, but the lad never noticed their coming or their going. When really forced to leave his precious books for bed, he would repeat the information he had learned or the lessons for the next day to his brother, who usually, most ungraciously, fell asleep before the conversation was half completed. When Horace was nearly 10 years old, his father, who had speculated in a small way in lumber, became a bankrupt. His house and furniture were sold by the sheriff, and he was obliged to flee from the state to avoid arrest. Some of these debts were paid, 30 years afterward, by his noble son. Going to West Haven, Vermont, Mr. Greeley obtained work on a farm and moved his family thither. They were very poor, the children sitting on the floor and eating their porridge together out of a tin pan. But they were happy in the midst of their hard work and plain food. The father and the boys chopped logs, and the little sisters, with the mother, gathered them in heaps. The voice of the latter, says Mr. James Parton in his biography, ringing out in laughter from the tangled brushwood in which she was often buried. Would there were thousands more of such women who can laugh at disaster and keep their children and themselves from getting soured with life. Everybody has troubles, and very wise are they who do not tell them, either in their faces or by their words. Horace earned a few pennies all his own, sometimes by selling nuts or bundles of the roots of pitch pine for kindling, which he carried on his back to the store. This money he spent in books, buying Mrs. Hemmons' poetry and Shakespeare. No wonder that the minister of the town said, Mark my words, that boy was not made for nothing. He could go to school no longer and must now support himself. From earliest childhood, he had determined to be a printer. So, when 11 years of age, he walked nine miles to see the publisher of a newspaper and obtain a situation. The editor looked at the small, tow-haired boy, shook his head, and said, You are too young. With a heavy heart, the child walked the long nine miles back again. But he must do something. And, a little later, 
with 75 cents in his pocket and some food tied in a bundle, which he hung on the end of a stick slung over his shoulder, he walked 120 miles back to New Hampshire to see his relatives. After some weeks, he returned with a few more cents in his purse than when he started. The father Greeley ought to have foreseen that such energy and will would produce results. But because Horace, in a fit of abstraction, tried to yoke the off ox on the near side, he said, ah, that boy will never get along in the world. He'll never know more than enough to come in when it rains. Alas, for the blindness of Zacchaeus Greeley, whose name even would not be remembered but for his illustrious son. When Horace was 14, he read in a newspaper that an apprentice was wanted in a printing office 11 miles distant. He hastened thither and, though unprepossessing from his thin voice, short pantaloons, lack of stockings, and worn hat, he was hired on trial. The first day he worked at the types in silence. Finally, the boys began to tease him with saucy remarks and threw type at him, but he paid no attention. On the third day, one of the apprentices took a large black ball used to put ink on the type and, remarking that Horace's hair was too light, daubed his head four times. The pressman and editor both stopped their labors to witness a fight, but they were disappointed, for the boy never turned from his work. He soon left his desk, spent an hour in washing the ink from his hair, and returned to his duties. Seeing that he could not be irritated and that he was determined to work, he became a great favorite. When at his type, he would often compose paragraphs for the paper, setting up the words without writing them out. He soon joined a debating society composed of the best informed persons of the little town of East Poultney, the minister, the doctor, the lawyer, the school teachers, and the like. What was their surprise to find that the young printer knew almost everything and was always ready to speak or read an essay. He was often laughed at because of his poor clothes and pitied because, slender and pale as he was, he never wore an overcoat. But he used to say, I guess I'd better wear my old clothes than run in debt for new ones. Ah, they did not know that every penny was saved and sent to the father struggling to clear a farm in the wilderness in Pennsylvania. During his four years apprenticeship, he visited his parents twice, though 600 miles distant, and walked most of the way. Soon after he had learned his trade, the newspaper suspended and he was thrown out of work. The people with whom he boarded gave him a brown overcoat, not new, and with moistened eyes said goodbye to the poor youth whom they had learned to love as their own. He remained a few weeks with his family, then walked 50 miles east to a town in New York State, where he found plenty of work, but no money, and in six weeks returned to the log cabin. After trying various towns, he found a situation in Erie, taking the place of a workman who was ill, and for seven months he did not lose a day. Out of his wages, $84, he had used only six, less than one dollar a month. Putting fifteen dollars in his pocket, he took the balance of sixty-three in a note and gave it to his father. A noble son indeed, who would not buy a single garment for himself, but carried the money home so as to make the poor ones a trifle more comfortable. He had become tired of working in the small towns. He determined to go to the great city of New York and be somebody. He walked a part of the way by the towpath along the canal, and sometimes rode in a scow. Finally, at sunrise, Friday, August 18, 1831, he landed close to the battery with ten dollars in his pocket, knowing, he says, no human being within two hundred miles. His first need was a boarding place. Over a saloon kept by an Irishman, he found room and board for two dollars and a half a week. Fortunately, though it was the almost universal custom to use liquors, Horace was a teetotaler and despised chewing or smoking tobacco, which he regarded 
As the vilest, most detestable abuse of his corrupted sensual appetites, whereof depraved man is capable. Therefore he had no fear of temptation from these sources. All day Friday and Saturday, he walked the streets of New York looking for work. The editor of the Journal of Commerce told him plainly that he was a runaway apprentice from the country, and he did not want him. I returned to my lodging on Saturday evening, thoroughly weary, disheartened, disgusted with New York, and resolved to shake its dust from my feet next Monday morning, while I could still leave with money in my pocket and before its almshouse could foreclose upon me. On Sunday he went to church, both morning and afternoon. Late in the day, a friend who called upon the owner of the house, learning that the printer wanted work, said he had heard of a vacancy at Mr. West's, 85 Chatham Street. The next morning, Horace was at the shop at half past five. New York was scarcely awake. Even the newsboys were asleep in front of the paper offices. He waited for an hour and a half, a day it seemed to him, when one of the journeymen arrived and, finding the door locked, sat down beside the stranger. He too was a Vermonter and he determined to help young Greeley if possible. He took him to the foreman, who decided to try him on a polyglot testament with marginal references, such close work that most of the men refused to do it. Mr. West came an hour or two later and said in anger, Did you hire that fool? Yes, we need help, and he was the best I could get, said the foreman. Well, pay him off tonight and let him go about his business. When night came, however, the country youth had done more and better work than anybody who had tried the testament. By beginning his labors before six in the morning and not leaving his desk till nine in the evening, working by the light of a candle stuck in a bottle, he could earn six dollars a week. At first, his fellow workmen called him the ghost from his white hair and complexion, but they soon found him friendly and willing to lend money, which as a rule, was never returned to him. They therefore voted him to be a great addition to the shop. As usual, though always scrupulously clean, he wore his poor clothes, no stockings, and his wristbands tied together with twine. Once he bought a second-hand black suit of a Jew for five dollars, but it proved a bad bargain. His earnings were sent, as before, to his parents. After a year, Business grew dull, and he was without a place. For some months, he worked on various papers, when a printer friend, Mr. Story, suggested that they start in business, their combined capital being $150. They did so, and their first work was the printing of a penny morning post, which suspended in three weeks, they losing $60. The partner was drowned shortly after, and his brother-in-law took his place. Young Greeley, now 23, and deeply interested in politics, determined to start a weekly paper. Fifteen of his friends promised to subscribe for it. The New Yorker was begun, and so well conducted was it that 300 papers throughout the country gave it complimentary notices. It grew to a subscription list of 9,000 persons. But much of the business was done on trust. Times were hard. And, after seven years, the enterprise had to be abandoned. This was a severe trial to the hard-working printer, who had known nothing but struggles all his life. Years after this, he wrote, Through most of this time I was very poor, and for four years really bankrupt, though always paying my notes and keeping my word, but living as poorly as possible. My embarrassments were sometimes dreadful. Not that I feared destitution, but the fear of involving my friends in my misfortunes was very bitter. I would rather be a convict in a state prison, a slave in a rice swamp, than to pass through life under the harrow of debt. Hunger, cold, rags, hard work, contempt, suspicion, unjust reproach are disagreeable, but debt is infinitely worse than them all. Avoid pecuniary obligation as you would pestilence or famine. If you have but fifty cents and can get no more for a week, buy a peck of corn, parch it, and live on it, 
rather than owe any man a dollar. Meantime, the young editor had married Miss Mary Y. Cheney, a schoolteacher of unusual mind and strength of character. It was, of course, a comfort to have someone to share his sorrows, but it pained his tender heart to make another help bear his burdens. Beside editing The New Yorker, he had also taken charge of The Jeffersonian, a weekly campaign paper published at Albany, and The Log Cabin, established to aid in the election of General Harrison to the presidency. The latter paper was a great success, the circulation running up to 90,000, though very little money was made. But it gave Mr. Greeley a reputation in all parts of the country for journalistic ability. President Harrison died after having been a month in office, and seven days after his death, Mr. Greeley started, April 10, 1841, a new paper, the New York Tribune, with the dying words of Harrison as its motto. I desire you to understand the true principles of the government. I wish them carried out. I ask nothing more. The paper had scarcely any money for its foundation, only a thousand dollars loaned by a friend. But it had a true man at its head, strong in his hatred of slavery and the oppression of the laboring man, and fearless in the advocacy of what he believed to be right. Success did not come at first. Of the 5,000 copies published and to be sold at a cent each, Mr. Greeley says, We found some difficulty in giving them away. The expenses for the first week were $525, receipts 92. But the boy who could walk nearly 600 miles to see his parents and be laughed at for poor clothes while he saved his money for their use was not to be overcome at 30 years of age by the failure of one or of a dozen papers. Some of the New York journals fought the new sheet, but it lived and grew till, on the seventh week, it had 11,000 subscribers. A good business manager was obtained as partner. Mr. Greeley worked 16 hours a day. He wrote four columns of editorial matter. His copy, wittily says Junius Henry Brown, strangers mistook for diagrams of Boston. Dozens of letters, often forgot whether he had been to his meals, and was ready to see and advise with everybody. When told that he was losing time by thus seeing people, he said, I know it, but I'd rather be beset by loafers and stopped in my work than be cooped up where I couldn't be got at by men who really wanted to and had a right to see me. So warm as this were his sympathies with all humanity. In 1842, when he was 31, he visited Washington, Niagara, and his parents in Pennsylvania, and wrote delightful letters back to his paper. How proud the mother must have felt of the growing fame of her son! What did Zacchaeus think now of his boy, of whom he prophesied, would never know more than enough to come in when it rains? The years passed on. Margaret Fuller came upon the editorial staff, for Mr. Greeley was ever the advocate of the fullest liberty for women in any profession, and as much pay for her work as for that of men. And now came a great sorrow, harder to bear than poverty. His little son, Picky, called the glorious boy with radiant beauty never equaled, died suddenly. When at length, he said, the struggle ended with his last breath, and even his mother was convinced that his eyes would never again open upon the scenes of this world, I knew that the summer of my life was over, that the chill breath of its autumn was at hand, and that my future course must be along the downhill of life. He wrote to Margaret Fuller in Italy, Ah, Margaret, the world grows dark with us. You grieve, for Rome is fallen. I mourn, for Picky is dead. His hopes were centered in this child, and his great heart never regained its full cheerfulness. In 1848, he was elected to Congress for three months to fill out the unexpired term of a deceased member, and did most effective work with regard to the mileage system and the use of the public lands. To a high position had come the printer boy. At this time he was also prominently in the lecture field, speaking twice a week to large audiences all over the country. 
In 1850, his first book was published by the Harpers, Hints Toward Reform, composed of ten lectures and twenty essays. The following year, he visited England as one of the jury in the awarding of prizes, and while there, made a close study of philanthropic and social questions. He always said, He who by voice or pen strikes his best blow at the impostures or vices whereby our race is debased and paralyzed, may close his eyes in death, consoled and cheered by the reflection that he has done what he could for the emancipation and elevation of his kind. In 1855, he again visited Europe, and four years later, California, where he was received with great demonstrations of honor and respect. In 1860, he was at the Chicago Convention and helped to nominate Abraham Lincoln in preference to William H. Seward. Mr. Greeley had now become one of the leading men of the nation. His paper molded the opinions of hundreds of thousands. He had fought against slavery with all the strength of his able pen. But he advocated buying the slaves for $400 million rather than going to war, a cheaper method than our subsequent conflict, with enormous loss of life and money. When he found the war inevitable, after General McClellan's defeat at the Chickahominy, he urged upon Mr. Lincoln immediate emancipation, which was soon adopted. The New York World said after his death, Mr. Greeley will hold the first place with posterity on the roll of emancipation. In the draft riots in New York in 1863, the mob burst into the Tribune building, smashing the furniture and shouting, Down with the old white coat! Mr. Greeley always wore a coat and hat of this hue. Had he been present, doubtless he would have been killed at once. When urged to arm the office, he said, No, all my life I have worked for the working men. If they would now burn my office and hang me, why, let them do it. The same year, he began his History of the Civil War for a Hartford publisher. Because so constantly interrupted, he went to the Bible house and worked with an amanuensis from nine in the morning till four in the afternoon, and then to the Tribune office and wrote on his paper till eleven at night. These volumes, dedicated to John Bright, have had a sale of several hundred thousand copies. After the war, Mr. Greeley, while advocating impartial suffrage for black as well as white, advocated also universal amnesty. He believed nothing was to be gained by punishing a defeated portion of our nation, and wanted the past buried as quickly as possible. He was opposed to the hanging of Jefferson Davis, and, with Garrett Smith, a well-known abolitionist, and about 20 others, he signed Mr. Davis's bail bond for $100,000, which released him from prison at Fortress Monroe, where he had been for two years. At once, the North was aflame with indignation. No criticism was too scathing. But Mr. Greeley took the denunciations like a hero, because he had done what his conscience approved. He said, Seeing how passion cools and wrath abates, I confidently look forward to the time when thousands who have cursed will thank me for what I have done and dared in resistance to their own sanguinary impulses. Out of a life earnestly devoted to the good of humankind, your children will select my going to Richmond and signing that bail bond as the wisest act. In 1872, considerable disaffection having arisen in the Republican Party at the course pursued by President Grant at the South, the liberal Republicans, headed by Sumner, Schurz, and Trumbull, held a convention at Cincinnati and nominated Horace Greeley for president. The Democratic Party saw the hopelessness of nominating a man in opposition to Grant and Greeley and accepted the latter as their own candidate. The contest was bitter and partisan in the extreme. Mr. Greeley received nearly three million votes, while General Grant received a half million majority. No doubt the defeat was a great disappointment to one who had served his country and the Republican Party for so many years with very little political reward. But just a month before the election came the crushing blow of his life in the death of his noble wife. He left his speech-making and for weeks attended her with the deepest devotion. A few days before she died, he said, 
I am a broken down old man. I have not slept one hour in twenty-four for a month. If she lasts, poor soul, another week, I shall go before her. After her death he could not sleep at all, and brain fever soon set in. Friday, November 29th, the end came. At noon he said distinctly, his only remaining children Ida and Gabriella standing by his bedside, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And at half past three, it is done. He was ready for the great change. He had written only a short time before, With an awe that is not fear, and a consciousness of demerit which does not exclude hope, I await the opening, before my steps, of the gates of the eternal world. Dead at sixty-one, overworked, not having had, a good night's sleep in fifteen years. When his death became known, the whole nation mourned for him. Newspapers from Maine to Louisiana gave touching tributes to his greatness, his purity, and his far-sightedness as a leader of the people. The Union League Club, the Lotos, the Typographical Society, the Associated Press, German and Colored Clubs, and temperance organizations passed resolutions of sorrow. Cornell University, of whose board he was a member, did him honor. St. Louis, Albany, Indianapolis, Nashville, and other cities held memorial meetings. John Bright sent regrets over our friend Horace Greeley. Congress passed resolutions of respect for his eminent services and personal purity and worth. And then came the sad and impressive burial. In the governor's room in the city hall, draped in black, surrounded by a guard of honor composed of the leading men of New York, the body of the great journalist lay in state. Over 50,000 persons, rich and poor, maimed soldiers and working people, passed in one by one to look upon the familiar face. Said one workman, it is little enough to lose a day for Horace Greeley, who spent many a day working for us. Just as the doors of the room were being closed for the night, a farmer made his way, saying, I've come a hundred miles to be at the funeral of Horace Greeley. Can't you possibly let me in to have one last look? The man stood a moment by the open coffin, and then, pulling his hat low down to hide the tears, was lost in the crowd. From there, the body was taken to Dr. Chapin's church, where it rested under a solid arch of flowers, with the words, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in front of the pulpit, it is done. The coffin was nearly hidden by floral gifts, one of the most touching being a plow made of white camellias on a ground of violets from the Tribune workman, a gift to honor the man who honored labor and ennobled farm life at his country home at Chappaqua, a few miles from New York. And then through an enormous concourse of people, Fifth Avenue being blocked for a mile, the body was borne to Greenwood Cemetery. Stores were closed, and houses along the route were draped in black. Flags on the shipping in the harbor were at half-mast, and bells tolled from one to three o'clock. Two hundred and fifty carriages, containing the President of the United States, governors, senators, and other friends, were in the procession. By the side of his wife and their three little children, the great man was laid to rest, the two daughters stepping into the vault and laying flowers tenderly upon the coffin. The following Sabbath, clergymen all over the country preached about this wonderful life, its struggles succeeded by worldwide honor. Mr. Greeley's one great wish was gratified. I cherish the hope that the journal I projected and established will live and flourish long after I shall have moldered into forgotten dust and that the stone which covers my ashes may bear to future eyes the still intelligible inscription, founder of the New York Tribune. End of chapter 15. Recording by Mark Duvall.